Professor Manisha for this wonderful introduction. And after we've heard some two wonderful lectures, we've come to a very mundane topic that is treatment of anemia, although it's extremely important. Anemia, as we all know, is a frequent complication of chronic disease and generally develops when the GFR drops to less than 30 ml per minute. That can occur even at higher levels of GFR. And as we all know, that the prevalence would increase as the renal function progressively declines. The management of renal anemia has been revolutionized after the introduction of the recombinant erythropoietin way back in 1989. The targets of hemoglobin in chronic kidney disease in non dialysis population is about 10 to 11.5. There are two important things that I would like to emphasize is that you do not start erythropoietin stimulating agents until the hemoglobin is less than 10 grams. And again, do not start the erythropoietin stimulating agents without ruling out iron deficiency. For the hemoglobin to improve, you need three things. You need erythropoietin, you need adequate amounts of iron, and you need something known as hypoxia inducible factor uh, hydroxidase domain inhibitors. Now, as we all know that the Nobel Prize last year in physiology and medicine was shared by three people. And the combined work of these three laureates, which includes Sir Peter Ratcliffe, who is a nephrologist at Oxford, demonstrated changes in oxygen in the animal cell to the action of the hypoxia inducible factor, transcription factor, which could alter gene expression. More than 97% of the oxygen in the bloodstream is bound to the hemoglobin, and the deficiency of those cells would lead to tissue hypoxia. Kidneys themselves in chronic kidney disease are relatively hypoxic, and this hypoxia inducible factor is a major transcription factor controlling the response to tissue hypoxia. Under normoxic conditions, where oxygen levels are normal, the specific proline residues of HIF alpha hydroxylated by the hydroxylase, uh, the pro, uh, proline hydroxylase domain enzymes. But when you have a hypoxic condition, the HIF alpha is not hydroxylated and it translocates into nucleus and dimyresis with the HIF beta. Then this HIF alpha beta complex that binds to the hypoxia regulatory activities and leads to activation of trans, uh, target genes related to hypoxia and increased anthropoietin production. Now in the kidney, the HIF1 alpha is mainly expressed in the tubular cells, where the 2 alpha is expressed in endothelial cells with glomeruli, the tubular endothelial cells, and fibroblasts. We have different hypoxia inducible factor inhibitors in current clinical development. Roxidostat, uh, which has been approved now, it's generally given three times a week. Then you have Deprudostat, Valerostat, Molidostat, Desidostat, and Anarodostat. And all these are going through various uh, phase uh, two or three studies before they're approved. All these inhibitors are administered orally. Now, what are then the potential advantages of these agents? One is that it increases or maintains hemoglobin levels effectively. It increases the endogenous anthropoietin expression in physiological range. It is shown to regulate iron metabolism because they reduce is hepcidin, which we'll be talking about later. It increases iron absorption and is not inf influenced by inflammation. Again, as I mentioned earlier, that all these drugs can be taken orally. There's no risk of hypertension. There's also the advantage of lowering of cholesterol, avoiding high levels, high doses of erythropoietin, and avoiding the side effects induced by iron supplementation. Roxadustan, which has been approved for clinical use in certain countries, Effects and also has shown reduction of hepcidin levels. And if you can see this graph, it shows that the change from hemoglobin from baseline to the average levels over weeks 28 52 was seen far more in with patients who were in Roxodostat as compared to those on placebo. Again, when they compared patients who were either iron replete or iron non replete, they found that Roxodostat resulted in greater improvement in hemoglobin from baseline compared to placebo. In patients, uh, 
they, they found that the requirement for rescue therapy was reduced by almost 81 percent in those patients who were roxidostat and the need for blood transfusions was also reduced by 74 percent as compared to placebo now when they compared uh, roxidostat versus erythropoietin and they found this was a phase three trial again and they found that there was non-inferiority of the roxidostat in treatment of anemia they found numerically greater mean change in hemoglobin in the roxidostat group as compared to erythropoietin group. The serum iron levels were stable in the roxidostat group. There was a re reduction in the dose of erythropoietin in these patients. Hepcidin was found to be significantly reduced in the roxidostat group. And patients who had high CRP levels, which was indirect marker inflammation, again, the hemoglobin levels improved in the roxidostat group as compared to those on erythropoietin. And this is just to show you the same thing, that patients who were in Roxidostat had hemoglobins which were on par with those patients who were in erythropoietin. And the important thing was that the hepcidin levels had reduced much more in the Roxidostat group as compared to those who were in erythropoietin. Yet another study from Japan, which was looking at patients who were in peritoneal dialysis and receiving intermittent oral dosing of Roxidostat, Again, a phase three trial, they found they had enrolled about 56 patients. Some of these patients were erythropoietin uh, naive, and the others who had been on erythropoietin and were converted into this rock on roxidostat. And they found that the cumulative response was 100% in the erythropoietin naive group, those who had not received erythropoietin previously. And this drug was well tolerated and effective in maintaining target hemoglobin levels in CKD patients on peritone dialysis who were previously treated or not treated. Yet another study from Japan, which looked compared this uh, double pointer alpha along with roxidostat, and they found that roxidostat maintained hemoglobin within 10 to 12 grams in patients on HT and is non-inferior to double pointed alpha. So there are certain adverse effects of these inhibitors uh, because of the diversity of genes which are targeted, targeted by these hypoxic inducible factor, they have been known to promote tumor, fact, tumor growth and many tumors overexpress and therefore associated with poor prognosis. Again, it's been known to be associated with pulmonary hypertension, which either could be new onset or there could be an exacerbation. And there's been some reports of hepatotoxicity. Now let's change focus and look at the role of iron and erythropoiesis. And iron deficiency is a major cause of hyper-responsiveness to erythropoietin stimulating agents in patients with chronic kidney disease. And 50% of these patients have depleted iron stores in their bone marrow. And therefore, iron supplementation has become a frontline therapy. And both oral iron was being, has been being used for the last more than three centuries. And intravenous iron, there has been, uh, the concept has been developed from the mid-1900s. Uh, the mortality rates in patients who had iron deficiency anemia has been found to be much higher. This was a study in Japan where they looked at about 900 odd patients who were not in dialysis and they found that those who had isolated anemia all with associated iron deficiency had significantly higher all-cause and cardiovascular related mortality. And patients who received iron supplementation had a 15% lower risk for all-cause mortality as compared to non-users and they have a 3% low risk of hospitalizations. If you look at iron metabolism, there are two important things that we need to look at. One is ferroportin, which is a membrane transporter. And this stimulates iron uptake by the intestinal epithelial cells and iron excretion by the macrophages. And the other is hepcidin, which is a peptide which is produced by the liver. And, these le and the levels of this peptide is usually very high in patients with chronic kidney disease. This actually binds and degrades ferroportin, and therefore to reduce the absorption of iron by the intestine, and this uh, well, leads to more iron accumulation with the reticular endothelial system. In addition, in patients of chronic kidney disease, we have inflammatory cytokines, particularly IL-6, which promote hepcidin production, and therefore again, it leads to ferroportin being degraded. So therefore, there are new drugs that are now being developed, which can modulate hepcidin. So this is just a microphotograph which shows you the same thing that ferroportin, it, it helps in the transport of iron across the membrane, whereas hepcidin has, uh, it inhibits or degrades this ferroportin. 
Now, the appropriate iron dosing strategy is still debatable, and most guidelines have adopted self-ferritin and TSAT as the surrogate parameters, but both these markers have their own limitations. The KDVO in 2012 said that iron treatment should be given if the TSAT is less than 30% and ferritin is less than 500 nanograms per ml. Now, what should be the route of iron administration? You can give it either orally or by intravenous route. Oral route has limited efficacy and the frequent gastrointestinal side effects. Intravenous route has high efficacy but associated with certain acute reactions, which could be anaphylactide uh, reactions could be there, and also can lead to bile plasma iron being released. Now, the most common Commonly used oral iron preparation is ferrous sulfate. There are certain new oral iron compounds being developed like ferric citrate, ferric maltol, heme, iron polypeptide, and oral liposomal sucrosomial iron. But the major concerns, as I mentioned earlier, are basically inadequate absorption and GI side effects. The treatment with oral iron may take as long as six to eight weeks, and dialysis patients being treated with erythropoietin stimulating agents very often are unable to fully utilize oral iron. And the secondary analysis of the fine CKD study showed that only 20% of the non-dialysis CKD population could increase their hemoglobin by one gram per deciliter after four weeks of oral iron intake. There's another concern about oral iron that it could potential for oral to alter the gut microbiome adversely. Both in vitro and in vivo studies have shown that oral iron supplementation can increase the production of uric toxins and may affect the circulating levels of other microbe derived molecules which can act as mediators for immune regulation. A word about this new iron preparation oral heme iron polypeptide is produced by hydrolysis of the bovine hemoglobin and uh, CKD patients who have high hepcidin levels, their absorption of heme iron is superior to non-heme iron. This is what the theory that is. But a study published in 2015 which looked at this heme iron polypeptide versus non heme oral iron versus intravenous iron, they found that the levels of hemoglobin are actually similar in all the three groups. And the other thing to remember is heme iron polypeptides is substantially more expensive than the non heme and iron preparations. Liposomal or sucrosomal iron, uh, this is has been subject to several RCTs, and this is a publication from Italy which looked at the liposomal iron compared with intravenous iron glucodated about 100 odd patients on non-dialysis CKD patients. IV iron they found was produced a more rapid hemoglobin rise as compared to liposomal iron, although the final increase in hemoglobin was similar. And after the iron withdrawal, the hemoglobin concentrations remained reasonably stable in the group which received intravenous uh, iron preparation, but it dropped to almost baseline levels in the microsome iron group. The adverse events were obviously significantly less in the liposomal iron as compared to the intravenous group. And this is just to show you the same thing. The dashed lines are the intravenous iron group. The solid line is the liposomal, that your hemoglobin levels more rose more rapidly when you get the intravenous as compared to liposomal. And as well as the ferritin levels are much higher in this group, and the T-side was higher in the group which received intravenous iron as compared to liposomal iron. The Prevalence of intravenous iron use has increased quite significantly. In the United States, we report an increase from 64% to almost 76% over the last 10 years. And the mean quarterly iron dose has increased from 500 milligrams to almost 650 milligrams. Generally, parenteral iron is preferred in patients with dialysis. And the 2012 KDGO guidelines suggested that you can use either oral or intravenous iron for non dialysis CKD patients. Several intravenous iron compounds are available, and the intravenous iron preparation should have a neutral pH for preservation of the veins and should have a wide dosing range to allow single repetition dose. And generally, they should not be requiring a test dose uh, uh, if, if, if for its use. The various formulations are available are iron dextran, ferric gluconate complex, iron sucrose, ferromoxetol, ferric carboxymaltose, and iron isomaltoside. And following the administration of intravenous iron, it takes is taken up by the cells in the reticular epithelial system, particularly in the liver and spleen from where the iron is slowly released. And these are just comparative details of the various intravenous irons that we have. Ferric carboxymaltose, 
added isomaltoside are the ones that we are now using more often because of the fewer side effects and the ability to give a single dose injections in most of them. So this is just to, uh, the chart showing you the dosage, recommended doses, the maximum single dose that we can give in these various island preparations. Now, which is the best route? Uh, either intravenous or oral should be determined by various factors. Uh, if you look at intravenous versus oral land, there have been various uh, stuff <coughs> from Cochrane database that shows that this that uh, intravenous island significantly improves the hemoglobin, the T side, and ferritin, and also is able to reduce the dose of erythropoietin usage. But there are certain adverse events which can be seen more with intravenous usage. Another meta analysis which compared intravenous iron versus oral iron, and it looked at 24 trials, and more patients who were treated with IV iron had a greater improvement of hemoglobin by 1 gram per cent. Uh, in non dialysis patient, uh, a publication from 2010 showed that this was four hour CTs in the non dialysis CKD patients, and all four studies reported the hemoglobin response was better with intravenous iron as compared to oral iron. The fine CKD study, which was published in 2014, looked at uh, three groups of patients. Those who had received had were maintained at a higher ferritin level, gave those with low ferritin levels, and those with who were an oral iron. And they found that compared to oral iron, intravenous ferroxic carboxymaltose targeting a higher ferritin level quickly reached and maintained the hemoglobin levels. So the authors in this study actually suggested that if you target a higher ferritin level by using a larger dose, a higher dose of intravenous iron, you can improve the hemoglobin levels much faster. And this is just to show you the same thing. Uh, the, they also were, uh, looked at the renal function in these patients who received the intravenous ferric carboxyl maltose as a, this was a, a subsequent analysis of the fine CKD trial. And they found that even if you give higher doses of intravenous iron, the GFR remained almost the same as that was seen in patients who received lower doses of intravenous iron or oral iron. Uh, this was another study which was published by Rajiv Agarwal and colleagues in 2015. This is known as Revoke trial. And in this study, this trial had to be terminated early when they were giving intravenous iron and they were comparing it to oral iron. And they found that they had very severe adverse events in the intravenous iron group. And there were 36 serious cardiovascular uh, events among 19 patients on the oral iron, whereas they had 55 events among 17 patients who received intravenous iron. Uh, now, there has been considerable debate as to between this CKD fine study and the REVO trial. Why this disparity between these two studies? The authors of the fine CKD study suggested that while they had used ferric carboxymaltose, the Revoke uh, study used iron sucrose. And they said the final CKD study was a global multi sector study as compared to the Revoke studies. The pivotal trial is the latest one that has been published on the use of intravenous iron in, in patients on uh, maintenance hemodialysis. And they found that high dose intravenous iron regime, given proactively superior to low dose regime, uh, and then and this high dose iron would help in reducing the requirement for erythropoietin stimulating agents. Now the question is whether there's renal toxicity of using iron and majority of the trials have not shown renal toxicity with uh, this tre iron treatment. There have been various studies in this. Again, what is the risk chances of cardiovascular risk? There has been a study that showed that cumulative iron doses are correlated with intermedia thickness. Uh, other authors have shown that if you give larger doses of iron, they can be so very significant increased risk of cardiovascular events. What about iron and infection risk? Most pathogens, as we know, require iron for their growth and proliferation. And iron in bottles have shown that iron overload resulted in worsening of infections. A study published in 2013, which looked at large number of patients with almost 8,000 iron exposure cases, and they found that high dose iron and bolus dosing was associated with increased risk of infection, later hospitalizations, and death. Other studies uh, did not agree. Almost this study, which was published in 2014, and Tangray colleagues in 2015, they did not find an association of iron administration and infection. So, whether iron should be administered, the presence of infection remains controversial. 
Uh, Long-term safety, again, there have been studies which looked at large number of patients who received iron, and both RCTs and observational studies have shown that there is no associated with high dose of intravenous iron with mortality or infection. So in summary, uh, adequate supply of iron is important in patients with chronic kidney disease. Judicious use of intravenous iron would improve with maintenance of hemoglobin that permits the use of lower doses of antibody stimulating agents. Uh, the risk of chronic and repeated exposure to intravenous iron is still not very clear. And the new uh, child in the block, the hypoxia inducible factor, uh, would help it is shown to improve physiological production of antipoietin, reduction of hepcidin, and it also helps in improving the hemoglobin levels in inflammatory microevents. And these agents can be used like killing two birds with one stone uh, by reducing levels of hepcidin and increasing the production of antipoietin. Anyway, thank you very much for your kind attention.